Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for another vlog with Mikey. And like I said, we probably won't have many more of these. Uh, we'll see what his filming situation has looked like after his, his coming move. But we have this one, and we're seeing some real progress. 345 flat bench. 345 flat bench, yes, it was grindy. This is a PR, and this puts us officially, since I started coaching him a year ago, maybe a hair over, this is a 50 pound increase on his bench. We've gone from 295 to 345. So, I mean, again, he's made great strides here. You know, everyone always says, well, he's real best at the bench. It's his best lift. But it's like, yeah, but we've put 50 pounds on it. He's built to bench, but we had to develop that, right? We had to put a lot of muscle on him in the right places. Uh, and yeah, you guys could tell that was grindy. There was almost some up and down to the bar. And there is up and down to the bar. You guys will see when we get to his box squat, which we just did a straightweight box squat this week. Got a big PR. Uh, you guys will see that. And you'll notice that he, he really had some issues with it. We're going to count it, but in like competition type rules, it would not count. Uh, then what are we doing? Floor pressing and incline bench and then tricep work. That's where we're going with him now. I'm pushing a little bit more chest i need to get him a little stronger out of the bottom on his bench right this is this is where he tends to stick on the bench is right off the chest well floor presses are great for that right because look at where the bar goes when he does a floor press stopping an inch or two short of his chest okay it will help we also are seeing a little bit of delt weakness we're seeing some delt weakness come out uh, so again, I want to put more incline in. Now, one of the things we'll talk about is going to be some of the snatch grip high pulls. He's been doing them very similar to the way I was doing them. I've made some adjustments with it. I've been messing with them a little bit off camera, uh, talking to other coaches, observing some of my lifters. Because I have other lifters who choose to do the snatch grip high pull a different way with lighter weight to where we go a lot higher. And you know what? Those guys all get tremendous delt pumps. Right? They get tremendous delt pumps. I notice the same thing. Uh, I've talked with other coaches. It's probably better, even though it's costing us a lot of weight on the bar. If we're chasing shoulder development, probably better. So something I'm going to chat further with Mike about. Uh, so again, he, because again, he's gotten so strong on these the way that we've been doing them. But it's really just kind of turning into upper back. And we're really shortchanging a lot of the, the delt development that he could be getting. So again, just something that we'll look at for this, because again, I observe my different lifters who do the two different styles of doing them. Uh, I've messed with them myself, and I'm finding, yeah, the other way probably is better. So we're doing for him right now, though, no supplemental benching, right? We've gone over to floor press, incline bench, JM presses. And that works quite well for Mike. Works very, very well for him. Uh, and because again, that's kind of what we did originally to get his bench up. It was mostly dips and floor presses. We didn't do a lot of benching to build his bench. We've gone through some phases with a lot of benching and you know what? His bench didn't go up any faster. It's just another exercise because ultimately we just have to build the musculature up. So again, I'm pulling all the, the supplemental benching out. Plus he was starting to get some overuse and wear and tear from it. He was starting to feel it on his shoulders, the same with his dips. Uh, so again, some changes here. People say, why is he doing body weight chin-ups? You had him doing weighted pull-ups. Correct. What we're seeing here, though, he started noticing some bicep tendonitis. And I know plenty of coaches who've done this. I've found historically one of the fastest ways to cure bicep tendonitis is to do high rep chin-ups. Higher rep chin-ups, right? Or as many as you can do with body weight. But I mean, if you can do 10 plus reps with weight, then by all means, that works also. But higher rep chin-ups. Okay, so now we're changing things up. You guys will notice now all this back work, we're rotating movements. As much as I might like certain movements, we rotate them. Okay, so we've gone from weighted pull-ups to high rep chin-ups. Again, helps with that bicep tendonitis. We are went from pendlay rows to snatch grip pendlay rows, right? You notice he's doing them with a wide grip now. Again, we're working around overuse. Same thing on his snatch grip high pulls. We're going to start, I'm going to talk to him about us doing them with a much lighter weight and trying to get more range of motion. Really, we need that bar to get above the nipple. It needs to be above the nipple. And we're just only getting to the lower chest, similar to how I have been doing them. It's not really optimal. So we'll work on that. And again, should help with his delts further. Uh, box squat. He got off of a parallel box 
435 on the box squat today. Now, it was grindy. Again, there's some up and down to the bar that occurs. Right, some up and down to the bar that occurs. But it has, just has to do with the fact that he was struggling with his groove. Uh, and this is the heaviest weight he's ever done on a box squat. So again, saw him dip down right there. And then he came up. That's usually a standard sticking spot, by the way. That is not indicative of a, a specific muscle weakness if you stick there. But in his case, he hit his sticking spot, dropped a little bit, and then re got, got back under the bar, got back in his groove, and locked it out. Okay. Now, for the record, at a powerlifting meet, that would be a red light, for those who, who aren't aware. In most strength sports, you, you, you have limits on what the bar is allowed to do as far as once you start the lift. And it, like powerlifting, for example, uh, that would be a red light. But he was still strong enough to lift it. So for our programming purposes, we will keep it. Right? We'll count it because he had the physical strength to lift the weight in that case. So for our percentages and speed work and everything else, we'll, we'll work with it. It's fine. But just be aware of those things. Now, we're doing block pulls. And it come up and people are like, well, how would you, you program block pulls for, you know, people who, uh, who need them? Right, for people who need these things, and let me look back over at my sheet, what I have written, because you guys can see it at the front while I'm talking. Uh, so we're doing two inch block pulls. I'm having him do five singles at 85%. Because again, this has come up. I've had people ask, how would you program that? And I'm like, well, singles at 85%. So the question becomes why? Because we're not up at 90% plus beating you up. There is a limited amount of recovery you can get away with at 90% or higher. You can only do so many reps. All right, we're already maxing. We're already hitting a max on, on these ME days. At 85%, we are not getting all the benefits of going above 90% for developing, uh, again, maximum strength. But what we are getting is technique and speed. What is it that we do block pulls for? Why? It teaches us to accelerate from kind of a sticking point. In his case, his sticking point is well below the knee. So a two inch block pull forces us to develop a higher rate of force production. We're getting practice doing that and exploding, having to explode as hard as we can off of the block, or we could do them off of a low pin, right? We're having to explode from there. It teaches, up to teaches us to develop a higher rate of force production through the area of our sticking point, right? And this is the area where he struggles. It's both technical and possibly, you know, neuromuscular. So we can do this to correct it. We can do some heavy singles at 85% because they won't beat us up. But why, why specifically 85%? Why not 80? Okay, we already know why we don't go above 90. Well, at 85%, the upper threshold muscle fibers are all hit on the first rep. So we can do singles and get a training response. We got five effective reps by doing five singles. All right, there's a training response to that in terms of the actual muscle fibers involved. So that's what we needed. That's what we're doing. It doesn't need to be a lot. We don't need to come in and just beat ourselves up doing a bunch of block pulls. Five singles at 85%. Focus on developing that, that rate of force production below the knee. And then obviously he did his uh, safety squat bar good mornings. I'm trying not to get tongue tied today. First video I've actually made in a, a week. I haven't actually recorded myself in a week. Actually, it's like seven days, I think. Eight days, maybe. It'll be eight days by the time this video comes out. I'll put it up tomorrow. So we did that. Then we did our Bulgarian split squats with the safety bar. And then reverse hypers. Again, all lifts that I do personally, you guys have seen me do. You guys know why we do them. And we're working all his different weak points. Um... And so again, pretty good, complete lower body development with the three lifts that we've picked here, you know, in addition to the, to the block pulls. All right, then we go over to dynamic upper day and he did his standard speed bench. His speed bench stays constant. I don't adjust, I don't do waves because we don't need to. He runs 50% of his max on the bar and 30% in bands, All right? And when I get percentages on speed work, that's how we do it. So a lot of times people are saying, oh, you're only lifting, you're lifting under 50% of your max. Well, plus the bands. And in his case, it's 80% of his max at bands. Sorry, 30%. So 
you're, you're getting 80% of your max on the speed work. It's just that not completely at the bottom. But band tension kicks in very, very aggressively, very quickly. All right. So it's still quite a bit of weight from the midpoint to the lockout. But again, it's for compensatory acceleration. And it should not be fatiguing. We do these with very short breaks. But sometimes people will get a little confused with the speed work when you add bands and chains and they're not thinking through just how much weight is being moved. You know, in his case, that's over that's 100 pounds of band tension being added on top of what he's got on the bar. And then, of course, uh, they got switched around. The files got switched around. But we did incline bench, which won't show up for a minute. And then we did his uh, JM presses. Again, JM presses are always a mainstay for, for Mike because he doesn't get elbow pain from them. We just unload them and periodically do them with accommodating resistance like we're doing right now, which would be reverse bands. All right, so it's incline after our speed benching and then JM press to again keep his triceps growing. His triceps are not a weak link, right? They're actually quite big and strong. He's got big arms, not a weak link for him. But we still train them because we don't want them to become one. We always do tricep work. All of my lifters do tricep work of some type, some type of direct tricep work. Of course, after that, then we do his chin-ups. And again, eventually he'll start, we'll start adding weight to them. So then we do chin-ups, we do snatch grip rows, and then we do snatch grip high pulls. Again, some of this is to prevent overuse, and this is one of the things that we can do with rows. We can go from a, a narrower grip, which is usually shoulder width, to a snatch grip. It works a little less lat, a little more upper back and rear delt, but we also use a lot less weight. And that's, that's come up before in some of my comments when I've messed with snatch grip rows. People do mention that, yeah, the stimulus to fatigue on a strict snatch grip row is phenomenal. Like, they do not fatigue you at all. You almost don't even need breaks between your sets sometimes. You can take a set of these to pretty much one rep in reserve, and a lot of times you can repeat that same performance with like a minute, 90 seconds. They just, they don't fatigue you. This, this exercise just does not generate that much fatigue. So in other words, if you really want to hammer some of those areas hard, you can do more training volume on a movement like this. Right, if your rear delts, for example, really need a lot of work or your rhomboids and things like that. A lift like this is one of the best choices because it will hit all these other muscles, um, but you can do a lot of volume on it. You can do a lot of volume if you need to. In this case, we're just doing it for some variation. And then his, his snatch grip high pulls. So again, we, we're seeing some changes. I'm rotating through movements. Because, you know, again, that comes up. People say, well, he seems to do a lot of the same movements for a while. Yeah, but until we start to get some inflammation. In his case, it's like we've, we've had a trap pull might have pulled one of his traps while doing actually his, his speed deadlifts. Uh, we're getting a little bit of bicep tendonitis. This is when we change things, right? When we start getting any sort of tendon inflammation, it is time to adjust movements, right? We could argue it, doing it when you stall is ideal, and that is a good time. But also when we start to feel any sort of signs of overuse inflammation, that's a good time to rotate movements on your supplemental work. Uh, then we did speed squats, and again, he's gotten better about pausing now, like I want him to, coming to a complete stop on the box, uh, which we talked about many vlogs before. You know, it's something we had to work on. And then we have the speed pulls, so he's still on a phase of conventional, and we'll go back to sumo on these soon. Uh, or we might even do some of these with conventional block pulls if we need to, for the extra block work. Again, to develop that extra speed out of the bottom, which is really what he needs. This is where he misses. He misses just a couple inches off the floor, right? And he's he's missed lifts that he should have made. He Mike is strong enough to deadlift 500 now. He just hasn't been able to. And some of it at this point is technical and neuromuscular. So it's completely fixable. And again, we don't do a lot of volume on his dynamic lower days. It doesn't look anything like mine. That's the one thing you guys will notice. My volumes are crazy high on my lower body days. I take it very, very seriously. I have built a lifestyle that allows me to do this, right? I built a lifestyle that allows me to do this. Uh, Mike's a busy guy. He's a busy guy, and he likes to do a lot of cardio and, and stuff on top of all this, just for, for general health. So again, we only had a couple of supplemental lifts for him today. And over time, I'll boost some of that up. We'll, we'll probably add more and more supplemental work. Now his work capacity has gotten really good. But today was simple. He did good mornings and reverse hypers. 
but again, I could I could start adding more more stuff in some split squats. Wouldn't be terrible if I wanted to add some more volume for his lower body in on these days. And then again, like I said, we finish up with reverse hypers, which you guys know how I feel about this lift. I think everyone should have access to one of these, and I think they should do it. But again, we got some good PRs this week. I'm happy with his training overall, so I hope it's been informative. And I will talk to you guys next time.